This is the How to Write Funny podcast. I am Scott Dickers, your host, and today I'm talking with stand-up comedian Margaret Cho. Hi, Margaret. Thanks for being with me today. Thank you. It's a delight to have you. Tell me what you're up to nowadays in comedy. I've been following your career, obviously, for many years oh. and would love to know what you're into and what you're doing. What I'm doing is um, I'm doing uh, shows. Usually I'll go to um, Europe and do a show there, like in France, do a show in Paris or mm. do a show in um, Seoul. <laughs> so okay. This would be the time to do it. But um, So now I'm on a little break. I'm going to go do a big show uh, with uh, Brent Weinbach, uh, a comedian I really enjoy, and um, uh, Natasha uh, Leggero, okay. and uh, Moshe Kasher, and Kyle Kinane. So all the young, right. young yeah. kids. And where are you in that? Are you the headliner? Or I don't is it know. All I, a guess, mix? I think they it's all a mix. Together? Okay. Yeah, I think it's all a mix. So that's good. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. So you're doing a lot of stand-up. You're doing yeah. a lot of stage. Which I always, I always do. I think that's a... The main part of my work in life is um, doing shows and and going around and and uh, so that's that's a very big part of who I am. I think as a stand up comedian. Yeah, and when you do these shows overseas, like in France, is that an English show for tourists, English audiences, or the yes. French speaking people come and enjoy? It's it? um, well, it's for uh, people who speak English. A lot of French people come. A lot of people who are expatriates too come. But it is in English. I don't speak French. Um, I haven't reached that Eddie Azard stage where amazing where he can learn other languages. And other languages, yeah, or Monty Python or whatever. I would love, I would love to do that in Korea. That's probably the one place where I have the potential. Because you are Korean and you probably speak a little Korean. Yeah. Now, are you, are you a first generation Korean American? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess so because Your I'm parents the first. Came over. Yeah, my parents came over, so I would be first. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so you heard a little Korean in the home. Yeah, I have a a kind of a. Um, some knowledge of the language, enough to get by, and so I could probably parlay that into an act if I really worked hard at it, and if I went there and hung out for a while. But when you go, you do an English act yes. in Seoul. Yes. And how is that received? They speak a lot of English? Do you get a lot of people there? No, but what I have to do, what I do television, and then what they do is they uh, put it in subtitles, and then they... Uh, light up the part where you're supposed to laugh because they also don't really have a stand-up comedy tradition huh. there. They have comedy, they have uh, comedy like sketch comedy, and they have like a lot of like sort of slapstick physical comedy, but they don't have stand-up comedy. St where stand-up comedy is very popular in Asia is actually Japan. Hmm. Japan has a very long tradition of literal like very stand-up comedians and lots of clubs and a lot of like things, but not in a in English, all in Japanese. So um, I, I think that there are a couple of clubs there in, in Japan that you can do uh, shows in English. So I haven't done that yet. Gotcha. Have you ever been to Japan and done that? Yeah. Oh, I've done it. I've done um, in Japan. I've just done just hanging out, but I oh, haven't okay. done uh, shows. Yes. Yeah. They have, from what I understand, kind of a strained relationship with the um, the Koreans, mm -hmm. yes. Japan. Yes. So maybe that's part of that issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm really curious to know about how you found your voice as a comedian. When, mm. when you first started getting on stage and you first started figuring out what was funny when it came from you, um, was that early for you? I think so, because I started comedy around the age of 14, and so very young. and I did, But I didn't really understand what I was doing until I was probably 18 or 19 because, you know, at that young age, you kind of get by a lot on the fact that you're young and that people are kind of amused by that and that's almost enough. And then I never really understood what I was as a comedian, I think, until later, until I had bombed a whole bunch of times and then I realized, oh, I think this is the way. And, um, you know, the more that you take risks, the more you find out about who you are and... Um, and so that helped me. I mean, the, the fact that I was living in San Francisco and there were a lot of places to perform was really important. Um, there was a club that I lived across the street from called the Holy City Zoo, which um, Robin Williams had been the doorman. Mm. And um, Rebecca Irwin was the uh, the barmaid. And she ended up, ended up, actually, they both ended up leaving, of course. Um, Rebecca ended up working for Robin and, and, and was his assistant for... Um, the entirety of his 
life. Wow. I mean, she even found him when he died. Wow. So she was she was always there um, till the very end. But um, they were big fixtures at this club that all the comedians would go at the end of the night after they'd done their shows, and we would just watch these uh, comedians like Robin Williams would go on and you know be making fun of everybody. And it was like the shows for comics, which I think is really really amazing. So I think through that, being around that helped me learn more about comedy than anything else. Cool. So what did you do like between the ages of 14 and 18 when you were performing at, at school or for family or just being silly or were you actually going out and doing I was doing mics shows. I was doing open mics. There oh, was wow. a, um, a teacher that signed me up for open mics with, I had a comedy partner in the very beginning, which was um, Sam Rockwell, who's a very famous actor now. He was your comedy partner? He was my comedy partner in the very beginning. Are you still in touch? No, I haven't talked to him in, mm. in, well, I haven't talked to him in a good maybe 10 years or something. What did you guys do together? Like a, we did a comedy these, duo yeah, on stage? Yeah, we did these really weird sketches that I were I had really no idea of strange. that. That is so, it was I never would have paired you two. <laughs> I know. It's an, well, because we were in school together. Okay. So that our, our comedy. High school? Uh, high school. Yeah. Wow. It was a comedy like team, but it was like our high school. So um, also in that class was Aisha Tyler, who's also now a very famous yeah. comedian and wonderful. And so it was like this whole thing that um, our teacher signed us up to do, but it, it worked really well. We had a good time. That's so great. What what was your comedy? Like, what did you guys do? I don't know. I, I feel like it was maybe closer to like something like we were pretending to be Nichols and May or something like, sure. you know, uh, kind of, a, or Stiller and Mira. I right, think that, right. that we were trying to be like a couple who did shows or, you know, that kind of... Um, thing so it was a uh, yeah it, i think we didn't really know what we were doing but we were just trying to get used to being on stage and being in a comedy club which was very different than being in like a theater in our s school it's, um, are these paying audiences or is it like you said like, comedy oh, for comedians like well those were th these were like paying audiences or they, oh. they were like open mic nights i see and then um also i was getting uh work with uh headliners to open for them like um brett butler Took me out on open hmm. uh, opening slots all the time. Um, and this is after you'd been doing it a bit as a teenager. Yeah, as a teenager. So you probably had somewhat of a voice if you're getting offered opportunities to open for like a big comedian. Yeah, a little bit. And then, but also I think that it was like, um, it, it was kind of an amusing thing. And it was like, oh, this kid does comedy and this is kind of cute. And <laughs> why don't we have her come? And so I did that for uh, Ellen a few times, Ellen oh, DeGeneres yeah. a few times. And... Um, for Brett a few times. Now, Ellen was just... Now, is this the late 80s we're talking about? Mid-80s? Yeah, 80s? early... La late 80s, yeah. Because, like, Ellen was just coming up like the rest yes. rest of you yes. at that time. She was just starting. Uh, the first time I saw Ellen was at opening... She was emceeing for Will Durst. Um, and um, the, I can't remember who was in the middle, but it was, like, maybe, like, Rob Schneider or something. Okay. But all of them were uh, were all kind of just around doing comedy shows and exactly. you were on a very similar trajectory, but it, you were just younger, so they yeah. saw you as more of a novelty and like, oh, that's so. cute. She's so young. Let's yeah. put her on. Yeah. And so I and I um, really worshipped Paula Poundstone. She was my favorite. I mean, she still is. I think she's genius. Very good. Yeah. She's so amazing. Yeah. So I uh, I just would go to her shows all the time. I ne never really worked with her not until much later was she based in san francisco also yes there were so many comedians in san francisco at yeah. that time yeah was that kind of the nexus of the 80s stand-up boom or was it new york san francisco i think it was new york san francisco la la was where you would go oh, of course to be on the television. improv and the yeah. yeah all that boston boston and san francisco had a lot of um community because you would see sort of like these boston guys coming to San Francisco, they would stay at Ron Lynch's house. Ron Lynch was a, he's a great comedian, but he um, had this house where all of these different people would live there. There's these like comedians' <laughs> houses that somebody would be like the leaseholder yeah. and like these comedians would just like usher through. I think that the house now doesn't belong to a comedian. It was the mm. first time in like 30 years that's happened. But, um, you know, that kind of thing like where comics would take over a living space and then you would just like usher them through. So it was like all of these different people coming from Boston to San Francisco and, and then vice versa. Yeah, and so they could travel cheaply 
and go to the main yeah. city. You don't hear of that anymore. People stay in hotels and they travel alone. Yeah, it's definitely not the same kind of community. I think comedians really needed each other. But the, that Ron Lynch's house is where I uh, met uh, David Cross, okay. who uh, was really kind of a figurehead in our group, hmm. our, our, our comedian group. You know, the, he was kind of like, I guess that would be like an unofficial leader and hmm. and Janine Garofalo and um, Ben Stiller, who I didn't know really, but that that was were, part of that group. Who were all younger too than, yes. than some of the other comedians you mentioned, like Ellen and those people. Are yeah. These are more this is your more generation. Yeah, yeah this like is more Gen X people or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's so fascinating. And so I wonder if it's not that way anymore because there's just so many comedians like... Hmm. There's, there's not a small enough community to say, hey, let's all share this house. Because yeah. it's like, almost like um, too big to accommodate yeah. that sort of a thing. Or that um, there's different ways that people are comedians now. Like a lot of times uh, at the comedy clubs, you'll see people who are um, doing shows that are like YouTube stars. Right. Or that are um, Instagram stars. And that's a, sort of a different thing. And mm -hmm. um, it, it's, I don't know. Like I feel like with com comics they living together um that was a very big thing i think maybe now with like airbnb and stuff like that it's maybe a little easier to find accommodations like a lot of the times we couldn't afford hotels or, or like a comedy condo was what you would get if right. you would, went to a club you would get this like apartment to share with the other comics and it was if you're a woman it was like a nightmare because it was so imagine. disgusting yeah I mean, if you can imagine, like, I can't. 50 weeks out of the year, it would have, like, three guys living in it. And then right. one week, is like, you come in, and it's just... I remember there was a wall that was, like, a decoupage of, like... Um, it was, it was like, art that was um, all plastered on the wall, but it was all pornography, and I'm pretty sure it was semen. It oh. wasn't glue. Oh. <laughs> so it was all of this... It was, like, a huge collage, like a wall-sized collage that every comic had added to. That was all pornography. I guess it was the things that they found the interesting, and they would put it up and add to the uh, collage. It was pretty incredible. I mean, it should be in like a Whitney Biennial or something. Yeah, I can't imagine a better symbol for the male <laughs> domination of comedy at that time. Yes. What a horror! Really incredible. It was really incredible. And you know, I didn't have I didn't have a smartphone, or else I would have taken right, photographs right. of that. And hopefully someone did. I, I'm sure somebody did. I mean, if anybody had worked there, this was in Anchorage, Alaska, at a comedy club that had a condo, and you would go and, mm. and stay in the, the condo there, and then, you know, that's what, that was there. So that by the 90s, the number of cities where people would travel and there'd be these communal houses expanded? Yes. There was one in Los Angeles that was on, um, it was right by the Arby's on Sunset. <laughs> okay. And uh, it was um, a big building, actually. It was a, different because it was an apartment building, and it was um, all uh, single-room occupancy apartments, and it was all comedians that lived there. So every, every, uh, if every apartment was just basically one room, and you would have a comic in there. And that, that was kind of this thing. They called it the House of Cards, which, of course, you know. That that's the the good name for it, but um, there was a lot of comedians that lived there, and uh, yeah, I, I remember them trying to think about like, oh, let's do it a, like a sitcom based on this show, this, this 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 atmosphere, because it was kind of this entertaining thing. You had a lot sure. of characters. Yeah, that would be too inside. Nobody would ever buy that. Sitcom. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> it's too uh, yeah, it's too inside. I mean, the, but there are distinct differences between like '80s comedy and '90s comedy, and I probably from. The two th early 2000s comedy and then now. It's, it's yeah. all very You different. could do it now because there's so many different platforms and channels. Somebody True. would probably buy that. I but, think so, yeah. Uh, and if it were a retro. Yeah, uh, that would be cool. <laughs> now I'm all excited about that show. That would be good. Uh, <laughs> the sitcom based on the communal house. I'm really curious about your writing back then mm -hmm. and how you figured out what kind of jokes were working for you and what your act was. And Did you do a lot of writing before you would test out your material? And would you write out complete jokes or did you rely a lot on crowd work or improv? Like what was your process for coming up with comedy? I think back then I did prepare a lot more than I do now. I think back then it was really like I had a pretty debilitating stage fright. So I would work all of the time during the day trying to um, deal with that by writing jokes. And um writing it all out, and, and I did, never really used my computer for that. I, it, it was very much about, like, notebooks and 
um, you know, journaling. Like the, this, like in the eighties and nineties, we had those like big moleskin books, and you would just right. like write in them, and that, that that was sort of like the thing. Um, but uh, eventually, I think I kind of grew out of the stage fright because I had been performing for so long, and then so nowadays, I actually don't even really do any of that, and then I most of the writing that I do would probably be on like, oh, I have to figure something out about this and then I would just go on stage and write about it or talk about it, you know, whatever that is. Um, so the last thing that I probably did was uh, writing about T.I., about him taking his daughter to the gynecologist. Right, yeah. And so <laughs> that whole thing like sparked a whole like conversation in my head about my par- my parents and their attitude towards uh, anything having to do with sexuality and, and virginity and how different that is. So, um, you know, but I, like now, so like going to write that, it wouldn't be sitting down and writing about it. It was just like, oh, I'll go on stage and I'll talk about it. And then something has to come out. That's what um, Bill Hicks said that he would do is that you have you are pressured in the face of the audience to come up with something brilliant. You have to. You just have to. You can't bring up something and not have it be amazing if you're in front of people talking about it. So that 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 adrenaline kind of pushes the creativity forward. So even if you don't have anything, you have this pressure inside of you to be yeah. amazing about the subject yeah. and feed off their energy to try to make sure that you're nailing something. And then obviously you workshop it and do it again to a yeah. new audience and then figure out what your take is on it or whatever. Yeah, so that sort of ignites something that That's you can't you do it. That's why you bomb a lot yeah. because you're, like trying, you're, always you're trying working trying. those things out. Yeah, yeah. and it's like a very, um, it's kind of a scary process, but then you're also not as invested emotionally in the outcome of a show like bombing nowadays is quite, it's quite easy. It's not like the crushing thing that it used to be when I was young. So now it's kind of like, I don't really, you know, it's because I wasn't, wasn't really doing this right or wasn't prepared. And then I can identify what went wrong about this particular joke and then figure it out. How important an ingredient is the confidence like obviously you have stage fright in the beginning, Mm -hmm. you have zero confidence and you're bombing because you're working out material if you had to give a percentage, like between the confidence and the material, what's most important for you, like being on stage? I think the confidence is more important because audiences are really, um, they're really concerned with whether or not you have your shit together. Like the, the, the whole point of the comedian really is to lead the group into kind of a, uh, into a thought and through a thought. And, um, if you don't have some control over that, people really lose interest very quickly because they don't they don't want to trust you with their attention if they're not going to go somewhere valuable like it. So you really the confidence really sells that um, you know you're buying their time with your confidence, and then hopefully the the they'll laugh about it you know and that that's really rewarding. But uh, I feel like confidence is more important than being funny or. Um, having anything valuable to say. If you can really uh, convince people that you, you've you got it down, you got this you got this on lock, then it's like, right. th- th- that's that's really most of what you have to do, I think. Yeah, no, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And they want to be controlled by you and they want to go on an experience and they want to know that you are competent to lead them on it. Yeah. And if you're not, they're like, all right, it's not working. Right, it's the competency that it's right. like really you you really have to convince them of that and i think that um because there's very in in really in in true uh like if you really look at comedians there are very few real geniuses i mean i think that the the few that i would say would be somebody like um tig Notaro or um mitch hedberg another one mitch mm-hmm. hedberg was really kind of my favorite thing because it, you know he had so many jokes and his jokes were so short that his his form was so precise that you couldn't make any mistakes. Yeah, just the punchy one-liners, yeah. one after another. And so many. I was always baffled by how he remembered the order. It's incredible. It really is. It's incredible, but you know that that's genius. You know, but yeah. that you you rarely encounter that in comedy. I mean, you, every once in a while you'll see somebody like that, but everybody else mostly it's like confidence trickster. And it's getting them on your side. And that's a different kind of genius. Sure. You know, but it, it's not as like clear as somebody like, you know, somebody like Mitch. Yeah. So when you started out, it your voice and, and the type of material you do has always been, you know, a little bit, for lack of a better word, like raunchy, like mm-hmm. you do sex humor and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And that was really 
trailblazing for especially a female comedian at that time. Yeah. Did you get a lot of flack for that? Um, I think that at, in the beginning, um, I remember um, some people telling me that it would be better if I uh, was not so dirty <laughs> and that if it, if right. it was, um, you know, if I was trying to choose between kind of persona to like pick the cute as opposed to the sexual. And then, you know, but to me, like I wasn't, it, it wasn't to be sexual. To me, it was about oh, this is actually what I'm interested in. You know, this is sort of the way that my life is going and I'm around all this stuff is super wild and I think this is interesting. And so to me, it was not about being sexy. I think that there was like this thing of like, if there's a young woman talking about sex, it must be sexy. But for me, it wasn't sexy. It was really like about all about this, like the horror <laughs> of having a body and trying to use this body to do all of these things that were really unpleasant and weird and like uncomfortable. And so that was more my um, point of view than it was to be like, um, there was once in, in, in the 90s, very early 90s, a bunch of female comedians got in Playboy. They did a special issue mm. that was all female comedians. I, I don't remember that. It was really great. And I, I didn't get in it, but it was like, I, I, you know, I think it would have been inappropriate for me to be in it, but it was like a very, um, it was a kind of a thing of like, you know, in like the eighties and nineties, you had like comedy, the comedy specials that would be like the compilation would be called women of the night and stuff like yeah, that. It, we, I think at that point we were, we were still, the culture was still struggling with the idea of wait, women can be in comedy. Okay. But yeah, we still want to make sure they're sex objects. Right. But okay, maybe they can get into comedy. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like a foot in both worlds. Yeah. It doesn't mix though. It doesn't, it's like kind of like it, it's, it, it really is a weird thing. I think that a lot of times women who are very attractive also in comedy have it hard. They have to kind of push past the expectation of an audience that they're not going to be funny. And so you, you know, you, you, you really have a, a tough road to hoe sometimes if you're a pretty lady doing comedy. Yeah. And what you said about like the cute versus the sexual, you use that a lot for like contrast, mm -hmm. like comparing like the, for example, the expectation of your parents yeah. versus your desires. And that made for really funny irony. Yeah. I think that's what you want to try to try to do is to use these sort of expectations about right. identity to kind of um, m explain kind of where you're yeah. at. But then the other interesting thing you did that like a lot of male comedians who talk about sex or even other female comedians talk about sex, you seem like you're not vanilla when it comes to sex. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so like you're performing for these vanilla audiences, tourists uh -huh. or these, you know, yeah. types of audiences. The job of a comedian is often to find a common reference point, mm -hmm. and 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 you're sort of taking them in a direction that maybe they're like, "Ooh, this is a little out there," yeah. you know. That's good. So that yeah. that is good. Yeah. But how do you? I guess that that comes back to the confidence, right? Like you're leading them into on this journey of, okay, I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna take you through some weird stuff now. Yes, and then it's also trying to point out what is actually normal about being weird, like the normality of the weirdness of like these journeys is is like so it's just a sort of about pointing out the contrast and whatever skill is there doing that yeah and the the whole embrace of the idea that we're all perverts mm -hmm. which you know is more common now i think in the 90s so much of the mainstream was like well i'm not a pervert and they, right. they held on to that right uh, and i think you helped people realize that the, they're kidding themselves. Yeah, and that's good. That you is know? good. That's good. And that's very San Francisco, too. That's a very, like... Oh, totally. San Francisco kind of point of view. Yeah. You know, it's like to, like... Hey, um, come on, we're all weirdos here. Yeah, it's good. So it's it, that's a great thing that you got out of the San Francisco scene. Mm -hmm. What else do you think you learned from coming up through San Francisco versus somewhere else? Um, I think that... Um, in San Francisco, that there there was a kind of respect for stand-up comedy that didn't necessarily exist in um, other cities. Like uh, the uh, the main focus to be a stand-up comedian, like say in the '90s or '80s and '90s in Los Angeles, was to get a sitcom and to be on TV. And um, and in San Francisco, it was really just about being comedian. I guess in to New York too, that would be like the same thing as an art in itself or an yeah. achievement in itself. And also the um, the gold standard was to create um, 
a comedy that was uh, that had value, that had emotional weight. Um, there was a comedian in the 80s and 90s named Rick Reynolds who had a show called Only the Truth is Funny. And, and I think that um, there was a huge uh, push to sign him. I believe like what Rollins and Joffe signed him. Like this is like in the 80s, like it's a very big deal. So this, I guess, would be Worldwide Pants signed okay. him. And, uh, you know, that he uh, was going to be the, the next voice of comedy because mm-hmm. it was comedy that was really um, questioning life and questioning why we're even laughing about any of this, you know. And it was really, it was pretty cool, like, exciting. And so that was sort of the gold standard of what you wanted to be. What happened to him? I've never heard of that comedian. I know. It's, like, weird. It's weird. <laughs> I saw him actually not that long ago in San Francisco in... Um, it was right after Robin Williams had died, and it was um, all of these events that were happening in uh, at the Throckmorton in um, just in Marin. So this community of like comics who all like would ride bikes with Robin all the time out there, and and so um, he was there. So um, and he was still doing shows, and I don't I don't know. I feel like maybe the world wasn't ready at that time. Um, did he make a pilot or something? Or yeah, I'm sure he did. I wonder if that's available on one of those websites that has yeah. unbought pilots or whatever. Yeah, but it's like the the his trajectory kind of maybe he was sort of ahead of his time. I think that he probably would have um, maybe he sort of become like somebody like Louis C.K. and then, but probably not done what Louis C.K. had done. But right. you know, something Wouldn't have like gone, that. Gone that direction. Well, Louis, but Louis did have that sort of th- that sense of like. Uh, like let's let's actually examine what's happening here and not laugh at it. Like let's get uncomfortable, which I think is a valuable place for totally comedians. You know, like I like yeah. I like that. And then that happened to you, where you got your own TV show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How was that experience? And when, it happened early for you. Right? Yeah, like really you were early. still really young, right? Yeah, I was about twenty three when I got a deal to do a TV show, and um, it was a time where you would have a lot of. Uh, comedians kind of starting to you know have great success in in sitcoms so you know it was the wave of like Roseanne of course and uh Jerry Seinfeld and um Tim Allen right who's the latest um and so it was a very big business um and Brett Butler also yep. my old friend and uh so it was it you know it was a very big deal to to get that and how did the opportunity happen? Did it come through some of the, like the Rhett Butler connection perhaps? Or no. did an agent just see your show and say, hey, well, let's do a show? Yeah, it was a couple of different things. There was a couple of like big showcases. I think it was like, I was at Just for Laughs in Montreal. And okay. So a lot of different people saw me sure. there. And I was different enough um, that it really was this appealing thought of like, okay, we could actually do something with the show. And then I, I was so young that it was like, I was just, I didn't want to, I, I, I didn't really even know what was possible, but I was like, I'll just take as much money as I can get. I tried right. to get, like, I just was like, oh, I'll just do, do whatever I can with the people who have the most money, and that happened to be Disney. But but the problem was is that I'm not a, a Disney act. You know, I'm not necessarily... I totally pepper. hear you. Yeah, you're not the, the, you know, especially with the sex stuff. Like, that's yeah. just so not Disney. It's not but so they, hard. But, and it was amazing how they actually, because I, I saw some of the show, mm-hmm. And it, it was amazing how they still kind of worked it in because it's like mm-hmm. you're dating. So you have like, right. you'll have a boyfriend uh, yeah. or a date or whatever. And then you have tension with the parents who they, they don't want you to be sexual. So yeah. they worked in as much sex as Disney was comfortable yeah. with. <laughs> but it was kind of like, it, it was it was a stretch. And then also there was a lot of um, opposition from the Korean community because the show had appeared right after the LA riots. And so you had a very strained relationship with the media the the korean community were so like put off by representation anyway they were anyway, skittish about any representation anything because yeah. all you had was the la riots and then you had um ice cubes black korea which had just come out which was a mm. single that he had put out about um just anger at korean merchants and yeah. um it was really difficult. So they, they were very anti-representation uh, in any form, and they yeah. really didn't like me. And so it was a, it was a lot of problems at the same time. Um, was the, uh, were Koreans a big part of your fan base ever, or was Disney just thinking, hey, we're going to get this demographic? I think it was just that nobody knew what, what was c- kind of possible. You know? And I think that there were, um, I mean, I do, do have always had a 
very large Asian American fan base. That's been a big part of my career. But the the generational gap between like sort of the old guard and the new guard, like it was always younger people coming to see me, not the um, people who were the heads of like churches and right. building societies. They'd be more <laughs> like, you know, the way you um, depict your parents. I don't know right. how accurate it is yeah. <laughs> for, to the real world, but yeah. more like, you know, you should be a nicer girl. And yeah, you <laughs> it was really threatening for, right. for that whole like crowd. So it was a... Uh, but it was perfect for the younger generations who felt that they were stifled by their Absolutely. parents. So it yeah. was good. Did you ever get involved in Chris Chan Lee's movie Yellow that he made? It was about oh. some Korean teenagers coming of age. And I know there there was uh, an actress in the movie that was in your show, played your grandmother, I think. Oh, um, Amy, uh, Amy, Amy Hill. Amy Hill. Yeah, yeah she's that's great. Her. She's wonderful. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I've seen that. Um but I, I think I, I mean, do I even remember what that, yeah, the, the name, yes. Yeah, because it like dealt with all those same issues. It was mm-hmm. like his parents owned a grocery store in mm-hmm. L.A. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, in San Francisco. Yeah. And he based the movie in L.A. I can imagine it had some of those same challenges with the mm-hmm. representation. Yeah. And I know it's the, the Korean American community within entertainment is quite small. Yes. I thought maybe <laughs> you would well, I run should, in with I him. Should, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I have to see that. I think that, um, well, nowadays, it's very much more of a stronger community, I think, because um, now we're sort of almost a generation in. So there's like right. two generations involved in entertainment. So you have a lot more people and a lot more projects that are around that. Um, so you're seeing a lot more representation, which is good. But now are the second generation less interested in talking about assimilation or the parents who, who came from the old country, are they just into, we just want to have a clean slate and do something new and original that, that doesn't have to do with our heritage? I think it's both. Okay. I think it's both. I think it's like identity is, is still very important, but then also being able to explore these different stories or different angles with, that haven't been seen before. Like, I think the reason why Crazy Rich Asians, which is a great, it's a great book series and it's great um, movies, but like, What's so exciting about it is that there, there's there's a little bit about heritage and identity and the culture clash, but it's also this new world that we haven't seen before. So that's um, you know, and that that, that kind of like that the aspirational ultra rich kind of thing is really fun. So I I think that there was like so many things that that brought up, and and it was so exciting to finally see Asian Americans in this aspirational world. Yeah, and like like you said, it it shows like the third generation mm-hmm. um, Korean American experience, which yeah. did seem new. Certainly, somebody like me who's outside that community, mm-hmm. I I hadn't seen that before. Yeah, so that's exciting. Yeah. So, the show lasted how long? It was a year. It was just a just twenty two episodes. Okay, and looking back, like what did you learn from that experience, and what would you do differently if you? had that same opportunity again? Because it must have been a lot yeah. coming to you young and a lot on your shoulders all of a sudden. It was really a lot. I, I think that, well, I would have made the deal with um, HBO, which was very different then too, but they were able to do a lot more in terms of like showing things and talking. Um, right. I mean, they hadn't uh, had the same kind of like um, programming, but this is like, you know, something that I, I, I should have done. I should have signed with somebody like them or Showtime or somebody where like premium cable where I could have done what I, what I meant to do. What, More like or, your act. Yeah, well, use the places that um, actually showed my act. Like I did comedy on HBO and so that if I used that, like, yeah. then that would have been a smarter choice. But, you know, it, it, things happen the way they happened. Sure. I mean, um, but yeah, that's what I would have done differently. Yeah. And so you, coming away from that, what do you take from it that you still use today or benefit from today from that experience um i think that the idea that uh that we can do the, this that, that that there's there's there is there is value in telling the story and then you know after i did the show and there was it was all very uh difficult and there was the cancellation i was able to write about the whole thing and do comedy about it so Great. you know that nothing's wasted you know in experience if you're an artist you can take all of that and keep on creating with that so that was really valuable yeah. So how has your family reacted to your comedy career? 
I'm curious. There was so much tension yeah. early on in your act about it. Yeah, they love it. They're excited. They, now they, they understand it because you've been it. successful at it. Well, also, it's kind of like it's more of a status thing because now their friends know that I'm actually successful so that that's <laughs> more important for Koreans to have like the status thing of like, well, my kid's doing this and this and this. So, you know, that they're on the hierarchy of how successful your children are. Like my parents are really winning. So yeah. that's good. <laughs> how has your comedy changed over the decades since you started? Um, I think that I'm more of a, uh, I think I'm 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 more of a, a kind of freer spirit around it. Like I think there's more of a um, uh, of a need to like more of a need to just kind of express that freedom and 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 not so uh, tied to uh, these ideas of what success means or what even like good jokes are. Like to me, it's really about discovery and um, you know, and also just enjoying it. Like I just I I like. I like the, the, the lifestyle still, which is good, you know, like traveling and then like going and doing the shows. I think it's really fun. A lot of comedians um, just get sick of it. So right. I haven't yet, which or is Or they good. outgrow it because yeah. it can be tough. Yeah. The hours and whatnot. It can be a lot. It can be a lot. And, uh, you know, they don't want to leave their families right. and they don't want to, you know, do with that. But I don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. So I feel very free about it. And also like I just like all of the other different channels that you can work in. And I, I'm also acting more, which I, I really like too. When you're more interested in the process and the, and the journey and the experience of doing it, and it doesn't sound like you write much anymore, you kind of wing it because you mm -hmm. have this confidence you can go on stage. Yeah. Do you still kind of have an act or do you have certain go-to jokes you may be open with? Or are you really just inventing a new act every show. Oh yeah, no it wouldn't it, it never goes that far. I I think that there's always like jokes that you have to do like you're like there is like a framework of Your an signature act that I introductory do. type of yeah. jokes or a frame that a you A frame use. that you put in things on and then um kind of comment on what's going on around that. So okay. hopefully that's I've I've gone through phases of being more improvisational and less improvisational so now I'm kind of in the middle but um it's it's really you know for me it's I just I just enjoy the performance, enjoy having having the lifestyle. So it's good. That's great. So yeah, tell me about some of the other things you're doing. You're doing some writing, you're doing some acting. Yeah. Um, what are some of those projects and how are those for you? The writing is is coming along. There's something that I am working on that I'm not done yet. So I'm almost done, but it still it's it's kind of a lot. But the the acting is really fun. Like that that's been more and more and acting in other comedians projects. I just mm -hmm. wrapped um Eliza Schlesinger's movie that she wrote and uh, starred in um, last week. And so that was really great because I really love her comedy and I love her as a person. So what was your part? I was her. I play her friend and and we um, it, it's it, it's it's almost it's kind of like a dark 90s comedy in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. So it, it it was really like I play this like very military lesbian that is like we go and we abduct somebody. It's really good. It's fun. It's, 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 it's a nice project to do. That's very different from what I normally do, I guess. But, um, so I did that. And then just before that, I did a uh, law and law and order SVU, which was very different. Yeah. So that's just like an acting gig, mm -hmm. not comedy at all. No, no. That's great. It was great. Um, I, I really enjoyed, uh, of playing sex trafficker. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Really oh, you're good. like a madam or something? Or yeah. Like, that's wonderful. It was really good. <laughs> it was really fun. It was based on a real person um, uh -huh. and uh, who ran a bunch of massage parlors in Chinatown and, you know, was putting people in indentured servitude. Wow. But it was, it was very, uh, it, it, it was very interesting. And, and I can't believe that they filmed this show in the middle of New York City just out on the street, you know, <laughs> but they do it in it with such style and grace. It's really incredible um, mm. for 21 years. It's a, it's a great show to, to be on. And then the long yeah. tradition of comedians who, who have been on the, in the Law & Order franchise, whether it's Richard Belzer or, or Robin Williams, of course, you know, there's like so many great yeah, people. Yeah, Richard Belzer did an amazing turn as a, a dramatic actor. Yeah. yeah. I'm really surprising. Super cool. What, what is that about comedians that they make the best actors who can do really great drama that makes you cry and yeah. really great comedy because they have such great timing. 
What is that? Why is that? I think that if you can do comedy, you can probably do anything. That's because comedy probably is the it. hardest. I think so, but there's also like there's a there's a level of like humanity that you really need to be a good comedian that really serves an actor. It's totally. It's very. Um, it's rare, but it, it you know usually the people that are our great comics are, are really good actors. So that's fun. Yeah. And did you find that you fell right into it? Could handle it? Or did you yeah. feel like you were out of your depth right away acting? No, I, I always loved right it. Yeah. I always loved it. And, um, you know, it, to me, it's really, um, fulfilling, you know, and it, it feels like a very serious thing. And, and, uh, also I, I'm lucky enough to like work with good people. And so then that, yeah. that's been really great too. Yeah. And then what about the writing? What, are you writing scripts? Are you writing books? Yeah, what are you um, on? I'm writing a script for something, for a project that I am not, it, it, I'm sort of like not, I don't know how, how like the, uh, uh, it's almost done. So it's like, I can't really talk about it exactly because it's not finished. It's, 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 but it's, it's something that I've been working on for a few years now. Oh, wow. And so it's, it's kind of a long time coming. And so that, that's, the, it is like, you know, when you're nearing the end, you have a lot of like issues. <laughs> of course. It's, it's definitely, um, it's getting there. So can you say even what medium it is? It's a play. It's, it's a, a play. It's a, it's a play. Okay. It's like a one woman show. So oh, for yourself. It's very different. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So how is that different from like a stand up uh, special, for example? I think because there's like got to be more, you know, with like jokes, y you have, uh, less of a narrative like you have less of a, 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 a you, you know with jokes you can buy a lot of time like in in a in a in a place but with like a play you know this sort of different kind of format there's yeah, a lot so that needs to be said so it's different yeah you're using like dramatic you're dramatically structuring it yes. as opposed to just having it be a sequence of bits yeah so it's, that's a different process totally different. so it's really um yeah to me it's a it's like i don't I, I'm a little bit out of my depth, but it's also been, you know, like a long time. So I think it's, yeah. it's coming along, but you know, it's a different kind of writing. Did you like read any books about how to structure drama before doing it? Or just dive No, right I just don't, don't write in. Take um, a class. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I always do. I always like, we'll take a class or I'll read a book or something. You just yeah. don't write it. Yeah. I think it just do it. I think it just sort of like. By gut instinct. But then on yeah. your show, did you write your show, your TV show? No, no. You had no. a totally different staff of writers. Yeah. Did you learn anything about like story structure from that experience? Yeah, and I think I've absorbed some of that over the years anyway. Sure, um, working on other projects yeah, and so forth. Yeah, like you figure that out. And yeah. um, I've written some screenplays before, so it's kind of like oh, okay. I kind of know a little bit about it. Um, but it's like, you know, sometimes uh, when you're also working with other people, as I am also in this project now, it's a little bit different too because... Um, it's a collaborative effort in a way. And so this, they're, they're guiding me and it's getting there. So it's good. Yeah. What's your process for writing? Because obviously it's a totally different it is. discipline than it performing. Is. I'm better in the morning. I'm better like right. Um, my head is better in the morning. And then like stand up comedy usually um, I think is better to write after a show or like after you figure something out, mm. then you like write it out or after doing something on stage and then you can elaborate on it because your mind is live at night. Um, but in writing this project and in writing in general for screen or whatever is, uh, for me, it's better in the morning, I think. Do you find you have to tap that same confidence that you need on stage to perform for that blank piece of paper or the mm. blank computer screen? Yeah, I think so. But, but also, um, it's it's a little bit of a different kind of confidence. It's more confidence in yourself that this is like a value. And then you have to sort of beat down that kind of like imposter syndrome, which I think all artists have. Totally. That, you know, is um, is sneaky. It's it's yeah. it's because it's right there um, <laughs> between you and the page, which is a very strange thing to have to kind of deal with. That's 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 sort of like the one the critic that inner critic, which is right. not doesn't serve me. Which you probably encountered in your early days on stage. Yeah. It was like in the back of your head as you yeah. were performing, and now it's there as you're trying to write. Yeah, which is like a very, I mean, but it's also become like the, that, that imposter, the inner critic has grown up alongside you. So <laughs> that's they, more sophisticated. They have more tricks. It's weird. They have more yeah. tricks and more, um, yeah, they have and more it's, stuff. It's like fluid. It, 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 you, you developed all this confidence and all this strength against it as a performer, mm -hmm. but it circumvents that and right. finds you when you're writing. Yeah, like it's been doing push-ups. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, you know what it's like? It's like Robert De Niro under your car in Cape Fear. 
That's great. <laughs> you great know, analogy. just hanging. Right. <laughs> and it, because you just, it's, it's just like a weird, so, such a weird thing. But it, it is like something that you have to circumvent and get around. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's the most difficult thing about um, being an artist for anybody. Everybody has that, you know, is, is to get over that, that your, your main opponent, which is that. What's your method for getting over it? I just ignore, ignore, ignore until I can, um, I can just do it. Like, I'll just, I'll just, I'm like, I just, I'm just going to do what I was set out to do and write and write and write. And then I'm not going to. And not to. worry about whether it's great or yeah. anything. Just, just get it out. I just let it come out and then I'll, I'll go back and fix it up. How long can you write in the morning? Does, do you have a limit or can you write all day? I don't have a day? limit really. I mean, not 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 for all day but yeah. i can it depends if it if it's going well i will uh i can do for a while but then i always try to leave something for the next day cuz i don't want to tap out and then have nothing that's a good idea yeah you know you want to have something you're looking forward to maybe churning up about yeah so you have to just have that little bit of it's like a hangnail that you want to pull yeah no that's a good tip like you have to do a little right. like just to leave that little like edge of something so that you can unravel. So when you finish the one woman show script, mm-hmm. you're obviously going to perform it. Yeah. Are you going to do it much like a stand up act where you're going to test it and ad- adjust it based on audience reaction? Or is this yeah. more of a, an artistic piece where you have something to say and you're just going to say it, audience be damned? Oh, I think I have to do uh, some audience. Like, I, I have to do some testing. Because that's just my nature. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you've been doing that for so long. Yeah, it would be like it'd be important. It. I think I, I would need to. And I'm assuming it's comedic, even though yeah. it's dramatically structured. So yes. there'll be a lot of jokes in it. Yeah. And you haven't tested those jokes in front no, of an audience, but so it'll be it'll be how fun. confident are you at this point in your career that when you write a joke on on the page and you haven't tested it in front of an audience that you're pretty sure that one's gonna work or whatever. I be, I am pretty sure. Like you kind of know, and also if something makes you laugh, then it's like, oh yeah, that that you know, you kind of know. Like I think you kind of figure it out after a time. It's like, oh, I think, yeah, yeah, pretty confident. Well, thank you so much for talking with thank me today, Mark. It's been a delight. Thank you. Hey, it's been great to have you along with us on the How to Write Funny podcast. If you want more podcasts, go to howtowritefunny.com. And if you stick around on How to Write Funny, you can find tips and tricks for how to make your comedy writing and comedy performance better.